Hello everyone, this is What Your Pastor Didn't Tell You. Today I am on with Dr. Matt Monger. We're going to talk about the Torah, the, the law of Moses, my, my Torah, and why it has weird similarities with the people of the ancient Near East. What is going on there, and how and what are they doing with that? And what do these, do these law codes mean? How are you doing today, Dr. Monger? I'm doing very well, thanks, Zach. Awesome. All right. It's it's Moses. Get it right. Moses. Get sorry. Ma yes, yes, yes. All right. Uh, so, do we have lots of law codes in the ancient Near East? Maybe most people aren't probably familiar with that. Uh, so, could we talk about those just to give us a context of of what what the the biblical text looks like when it when it comes into the scene? So, what kind of law codes do we have in the ancient Near East that have that have been preserved today? Yeah. So. We, we're actually really uh, lucky or, I mean, we're in a really pleasant situation when it comes to studying ancient law codes because of the, of the material we have from ancient uh, Babylonia and Assyria and, and also from the, the Hittite world. So, so the cuneiform writing world uh, mm -hmm. preserved a number of, of law codes that regulate or seemingly regulate a number of day-to-day -day affairs. So we have, um, you know, as far back as the as the the third millennium, so the two thousands BC, we have law codes that are are you know written in clay or chiseled into stone that that have been preserved and that um, you know I, I guess obviously predate the biblical law codes but also help us contextualize what we find in the biblical law codes. Mm -hmm. um, and so what, I mean, the situation that we have today basically is, is the result of the past 150 years of, of research that's been done after um, scholars and archeologists started digging up clay tablets in, in the Middle East, in, in mm -hmm. you know, the, what's today Iraq and, and Syria and, and Turkey basically. And finding law codes that um, retain regulations uh, that that are very very familiar from from the biblical records, mm. and and that's like that's kind of the the way they were interpreted as well because the people that were reading these things for the first times often knew the biblical record, knew the the Torah pretty well, mm. and so they they immediately drew the associations to these law codes that we found. And mm. uh, and it was actually pretty shocking, you know, for a number of people, and especially like the, around the end of the 1800s, beginning the 1900s, it was pretty pretty surprising for a lot of people to discover that there were these ancient records that were mm -hmm. comparable to the the law of Moses, because there was you know a more general understanding or idea that that the law of Moses was was the first of its kind, that it was very special, that it was different, mm -hmm. you know, from everything else. And, and what we have is, is, you know, this pretty traceable uh, tradition of, of giving laws in the form of coherent law codes all the way back to the 2000s. And, and I mean, and pretty much no matter how you date your chronology of the, of the Bible, you end up going, going with Moses before or Moses after that. So, mm -hmm. um, but I mean, basically what, what we have, like the, we have a number of, of law codes. The most famous one is, is probably what is known as the law, the laws of Hammurabi or the code of Hammurabi or uh, codex Hammurabi as they call it in the, in the literature, um, which is from about 1750 BC and is, is also probably the most extensive, most coherent one that we have retained. Uh, and that is, basically because it was like literally chiseled in a seven foot stone that has been recovered and is in the basement of the Louvre uh, Museum in Paris. And so we have that collected because of the way it was, it was written down. But we have cuneiform tablets with other law codes. So we have the, the laws of Eshnuna, which, which probably are maybe even 200 years earlier than Hammurabi. Uh, we have a Sumerian law code called the, the Ur-Namu, laws from the yeah, maybe 2100 BC, 2050 BC, mm -hmm. something like that. Um, there are also law codes in uh, Hittite from the 1600s thereabouts and later BC. 
and the Assyrian law codes, we have witnesses from the 1400s and on. So, so this is a very, there was a very vibrant law giving um, culture and mm -hmm. there were very organized societies. There was there, and there were laws that regulated trade, regulated, um, you know, day-to-day -day affairs within mm -hmm. normal society, death, um, loss of property, theft, those kind of things. And, um, and and so for you know for me it's just it's important to highlight that that we're we have a very clear um, idea of the rights of people that that go all the way mm. back and in, into these law codes uh, you know to four thousand years ago at least. Hmm. Yeah, that's really fascinating. Uh, of course, that that can be very helpful as far as seeing what the the law code of Moses is supposed to be and we're going to get in that today and um, you know help us interpret what specifically these law codes are supposed to mean um, because if these same things are being said in the same context of other things that are said then it simply just makes sense that maybe they were meaning the same thing um, so we'll get into that though so let's talk about the something you mentioned in one of your videos that a lot of these law codes had a prologue. Yeah. Could you talk about what that is, what that purpose was, why is it significant? Yeah. So, so this, the, like the structure of the ancient law code is, is like you say, there's kind of a, there's a prologue and then there's the main body of laws and then there's an epilogue. And, hmm. and that is um, it, well, it serves, it serves a number of functions, but I would say the main function of a prologue is to give legitimacy and authority to the lawgiver, and this is one of those things that I, I think actually makes a lot of sense also to us just intuitively. Is that if you would see something or be given something and be told, "Here, you need to follow this, these rules, or whatever," you you would uh, almost immediately say, "Says who?" You know, that's a <laughs> who who gives you the right to tell me what to do. And yep. and so the 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 most extensive prologue is in the in the laws of Hammurabi and and there basically it begins by explaining that the gods have given yeah great that that's the stone right there um, and so that it begins by explaining how the gods have given Hammurabi uh, the authority to be king uh, uh, over the people and to then lay down the laws for the people. And then it goes on this long, um, this long series of of names or descriptions of Hammurabi about how just he is and how uh, wonderful he is and how many great deeds he has done uh, by the grace of the gods. And so the the basic uh, thing that happens in these prologues is that we have this kind of transfer of authority on the earthly realm from from the gods to to the mm -hmm. man. Who will enforce the laws, or who will have at least the the authority to enforce the laws and to, to define the laws as they are, and so we we have this connection to the divine realm that becomes very clear, and then at the end we have these epilogues that basically um, say and um, the authority here um, that was granted to this king will be upheld by the gods who will punish or curse those who don't keep the laws and bless those who do. And so it's kind of this, this way of bookending the laws by both saying, hey, these laws are, are legitimate, they're authorized by the gods, and if you do keep them, the gods will bless you. If you don't keep them, then we will punish you. Mm -hmm. And it kind of creates a, a, a reality by naming the gods. So, so Hammurabi is, is named as the king that was given authority by Anum and Enlil and Marduk. And these are the great gods of the Babylonian world. And so people that, that would hear this read aloud or whatever would automatically associate that, uh, that this great king who has been authorized by these great gods um, has the right to lay down these laws for the people. Hmm. Yeah, no, that's really, that's really great. So, so does does the biblical text have something like this? So I think it does. Um, I, I really think it does. I think that the um, in the way we have the the book of Exodus right now, 
I think that it basically the whole story of Moses leads up to this moment on on Sinai when God gives mm -hmm. the law to to Moses, and um, and I think even when we break it down into sources, so I don't know where you stand on the whole source criticism kind of thing mm -hmm. and the documentary hypothesis and all that, but even if we break it down into its kind of component parts, we still have these these meetings between Moses and God prior to the giving of the law. And, and what, what happens in the first, say, uh, 13 or maybe 19 chapters of, of, uh, of Exodus, depending on, on how you read it, uh, what we see is, is basically the story of why everyone should listen to Moses as the giver of the law. And, and that begins with his birth. I mean, so the birth narrative of, of Moses being being a hero and being you know saved miraculously by the by the daughter of Pharaoh taking up and bringing him up in the in the house of Pharaoh and all that. But but then really it becomes it becomes real when when Moses meets God on the mountain. And and this like there there are so many lines, literary lines, right, being drawn between the the fire, the burning bush, the the fire of God or the cloud on the mountain, giving the law, Moses, you know, going up and meeting God and coming back with this important thing. And so first the first time it's to free the Israelites, and then the second time it's the law. And and this story kind of makes it very clear that Moses is not just a normal person. He's not just a random guy that comes along and says, I'm now your king and I'm going to give you the laws. But he is this divine authority that has been given to him both to lead the people in their physical journey, but then also in the in the giving of the law. And so I think like for me that this really this whole story kind of legitimatizes uh, Moses as the lawgiver um, in, in the same way that these um, yeah, that the that the prologues of these other law codes do. And, and it's also really yes. interesting, like when we see when Moses, you know, learns the the name of God, that that God also says to Moses, like you, you know, you're the um, to to your um, ancestors, to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, I was known as El Shaddai, but you will know me as as Yahweh. And, and like, that's also kind of invokes other names of other gods kind of in the same way that we see in these prologues like it's a uh, it's kind of the the divine authority brings in other names and, and shows how this is not just for anyone who knows me as yahweh but it's also for those who might know me as al shaddai or whatever like you are the authority here hmm. interesting okay all right so just to make sure we didn't like people didn't confuse what you said so you said that there were uh, multiple names so you actually, I think you might have even said the word gods. Uh, so, you, you know, maybe you take a different view than most people. Are you, are you saying that when Moses, or sorry, when the God says this to Moses, that he's saying, hey, those all other gods, they are me, or what you see is those other gods, those are me? So, no, so what I'm saying is the other names. So I'm not, I'm not trying to say other gods like that. Um, I'll, for this, for this point, I'll, I'll remain agnostic <laughs> on, on that point. Uh, it doesn't matter to me either way. Like what's interesting is that mm. when Moses is there on the mountain and, mm. and is, is talking with God or whatever, um, like the, the scene literally says like you, your, your ancestors knew me as El Shaddai and gives this other name and says, but actually it's me, Yahweh. And, and so what that communicates to me is that people mm. will know him as El Shaddai or will know the name El Shaddai and they won't know exactly, might not know who Yahweh is. And so they might mm. say, well, wait, our gods were, our, our ancestors worshiped El Shaddai. So why are you, who are you to say we should go follow Yahweh into the desert? What's, what is that? Mm. And what this is doing is mm. trying, trying to say, well, followers of El Shaddai, followers of Yahweh, everybody, mm. hey, follow me, I'm Moses. And, and this is the same. Like that's equating them. And so the text is definitely mm. equating these two and saying El Shaddai is Yahweh. But yep. uh, if we want to talk historically, maybe they were conceived of as different things at some point, but that's, that's not relevant really for this <laughs> text, I would say, right. because what's important is that for the author of this, this pericope in, in, in Exodus is that it's, it's definitely, um, Yahweh and El Shaddai should be seen as the same for the people. Yep. Right. Okay. And, and you know, that makes sense specifically with the whole prologue thing. I mean, maybe it's not as obvious because when we look at something like the code of Hammurabi, it's, you know, pretty much just a code and 
you know, you do have a prologue and epilogue after that, but it's it's more obvious, I guess, what the main focus is um, compared to the the Torah, where you know there's a lot more story to it. Would you say that's why the epilogue or and the prologue aren't as obvious? Um, yeah, I mean, I think so. I think what what we have in the Torah is is a, definitely the product of a literary um, development in a different way than we see in the law codes uh, so that mm-hmm. the, the traditions of Israelite literature and, and scribal culture has, has definitely created a, a coherent narrative from, mm-hmm. you know, from, well, from, you know, from Abraham through to, to, um, through the, 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 you know, what it would, I guess through, you know, through the end of the, <laughs> the, the, the Bible actually. But, um, but what's interesting, I think <laughs> is, exactly what you're kind of getting at is that we still see we still see traces of the the point like the intention of these these things so like the point of the prologue which is to legitimize or authorize Moses or the 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 king priest mm-hmm. king whatever as the as the lawgiver that we still find that feature in the tales that come beforehand but it's not it's not written exactly the same um, it's more of a literary um, has more of a literary f- flourish and has much more narrative feature than we find mm-hmm. in the in the prologues of these ancient law codes. But I don't think that the the function is any different. Mm. Yeah, interesting. Okay, alrighty. And uh, what would you say is the purpose of these extra biblical law codes? So obviously you mentioned the the prologue and epilogue have their own purposes, uh, but just the 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 biblical or yeah, the, the, the law codes in general, why were they used? Was it literally just, hey, here's a law that you guys need to follow, or was it something else? Um, yeah, th- that's a really good question. And that's one that I don't, I don't actually know if we have a good consensus on um, right mm-hmm. now. I okay. think it's, it's, still, uh, it's still an open question what exactly the purpose was, because we have so, so I guess if we, if we just uh, look at it kind of historically, the development of what, what we've thought, what people have thought, um, mm-hmm. like, I mean, originally when these, when these things were found, it was pretty, um, it was pretty normal to think, Hey, these are laws that this must've been what people right. did, the way people acted, the way, the way it was in, in antiquity, right. Mm. Or, or in that, in that time. And, uh, and I, like, I, I think that's, that's a well-founded assumption. It makes sense that people would go there immediately. But what's happened is that when, when, when you read these things uh, clearly, you know, when you start to go in details and ask what is, what is this text actually about, uh, you start to see that there's problems in thinking that the law code is something that, that is comprehensive enough to be the laws of Babylon, right? So when you read the laws of Hammurabi, you have, you know, these 200 and three, almost 300 laws, but that's not enough to govern a society. And so you kind of end up in this, uh, this development in scholarship is moves in the direction of asking, so what if they weren't a comprehensive, uh, Mm. what if they weren't a comprehensive law code meant to govern everything? And then, Basically, things have gone in two directions, um, or I don't know, maybe it's three, but they're, like the main thoughts kind of go towards one that it, these might just be um, uh, like royal propaganda, which is kind of one of those um, things that yeah people started to say, I don't know, um, a couple of generations ago, a generation ago in scholarship is that propaganda became, became like this big thing that we use and say, well, it's royal propaganda. So you have this big, great mm-hmm. prologue that says, Hey, I'm the great king, and the gods put me here to spread the rule of law in this country or in this land. And here's some of my laws. You must follow them, and you'll be, you know, cursed if you don't. And then it really didn't matter what the laws actually said, because at the end of the day, it's only the ruling class, the the scribes, the the interpreters of the law, the judges, whoever, who could actually read it or know it. So, so regular people mm-hmm. couldn't like come and test it and say, "Hey, I've actually read, <laughs> I've read those laws, and you are wrong, man." Like, there's, there's <laughs> no, there's no appeals, there's no way of checking, and so the the existence of this giant 
law code is in itself propaganda for the king and his legitimacy and for the courts and for the for everything. Um, so that's like that's one way of looking at it, that this wasn't ever meant to be a real defining law code for everybody, but that it was just examples in a way of, of what you could uh, get to. Um, hmm. More recently, there's been some speculation that that it could be more intellectually developed than that, so that this might be, um, well, it could go in two ways then. One is that it could be just part of a scribal culture where you're you're collecting lists of things to, hmm. um, I mean, this this happens a lot actually in, in Babylonia, but also throughout the ancient Near East is that you make lists of things. And so we have lists of kings and we have lists of curses and we have lists of blessings and we have lists of gods and you have, you know, all kinds of different lists and that this might be one, one of them. Like these law codes were kind of lists of laws that we knew about, uh, but they they weren't meant to give you everything that was out there, but they were more to practice writing and they help you understand the form of law and they help you understand the, the different mm -hmm. categories of laws, but that it's not in the way we think of as like a law code, comprehensive law code, but it's more of a practice or a, a way of, of keeping things alive. But then another another kind of way of thinking in the same direction would be to say that these are also could have been meant to be um, like like precedents in a way, like in, in, in our legal terminology, that it's kind of like when you do something along these lines, you can punish them like mm -hmm. this. And that we don't mm. have like it, you didn't need specifics in every case, but you could just go to the law codes and and say, well, here's the general way in which we write laws and which we enforce laws in our society. And so then when you encounter a similar thing, you 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 use a similar logic to it. Mm. And and one of the reasons why this is pretty a pretty popular way of thinking right now is that um like according to Martha Roth, who is like the the kind of expert right now on on Mesopotamian law and law codes, um, it, there is maybe one example at all of a cuneiform law text that cites any of these law codes. Like, so there's only one place where someone says, like, according to the law, <laughs> we must judge it like this. Mm -hmm. And so there's not like this, there's not all these tablets out there that say, well, according to Hammurabi's law 187, we must punish you in this way. Like it's not used as specific reference, but we do find a lot of cases where people are judged, you know, are, 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 you know, given a judgment based on just judgments. Like they're told you did this, so you get this punishment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. John John Walton's a a big, uh, he's big into the whole, um, kind of like guidelines, but um, maybe I'm messing up his view or other people's views. But I'm on the impression that there's some people that have said that hey, the law codes of something like, well, actually, let me I'm skipping here. Do you think these are the same purposes of the, of the biblical text, like? Yeah, there's one thing that maybe all these people outside of Israel thought this way. Is it another thing to say that the the writers of the biblical text thought the same in regards to their law? Well, that's that's a really good question, and I think um, we have to nuance it because I think one we have to think about how the biblical law codes actually are and came to be and mm -hmm. and and fit, retained their <laughs> their form. Mm -hmm. And then we have to also think chronologically, like, or, you know, where we are in history uh, about that. Mm -hmm. So I would say definitely by, uh, by say, so Jesus' time or the late Hasmonean, early Herodian period, mm -hmm. if you want to use technical terms, um, yeah. we, we do see the law as being understood, the Mosaic law the Torah mm -hmm. as being understood as something that regulated the way in which people should live. Mm -hmm. And, and that was not just for the priests or for the, for the, for a very small group. Uh, mm -hmm. But there's not a lot of evidence for the Torah having regulated wide, widely the, the lives of Judeans or, or Israelites 
prior to the Hasmonean period. Um, mm. And so then, so that really becomes kind of a question of before, say, 180, 170, 160 BC, whatever, um, did did the everyday Israelite or Judean um, feel like the Torah was binding in, in every which way? And and we, we don't have enough data to really say that it was, and uh, there are a number of people that, that think that means it probably it wasn't that binding. Mm -hmm. um, and so in that way, we could make that draw a parallel, right? That, that these laws were maybe seen as, as, you know, um, if, if people knew about them, they were, they were considered something that was related to the, to the elite or to some kind of centralized religion or, but we don't know, we don't have any evidence. Mm -hmm. We don't have any discussions of it. We don't have um, any way of really knowing how, how, how people were relating to it. Um, but what we do know is that, or what I would say we know, and, and I think the consensus is pretty clear is that mm -hmm. um, these, like the, the Torah is made up of several earlier law codes that have been sewn together. And so we have uh, glimpses, um, snapshots into different periods of the law in ancient Israel so that we, we see that um, it develops, right? It, 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 it changes in, in function and in structure from the, the earliest version, which probably is related to a much smaller, um, more um, agricultural society and where it grows mm. into the more regulated temple based um, ritual context. And, and so I think that, that, that shows that it's, it's a dynamic thing. It's a dynamic process, which happens through history. And so the purpose mm. of the law also changes as the law codes are adapted and, and, and connected mm. together. And when it becomes one thing that is used by the authorities to um, to regulate people's lives, then it, of course, is functioning in that way. But we just don't know if it was how or how much it was prior to that. Mm. Okay. All right. Uh, so we'll we'll kind of come back to that once we get a, a good idea of what you're referring to with the whole, uh, I guess, parallels and all that kind of stuff. So what would you say are the most striking parallels? when we compare the biblical text with texts outside the Bible and um, like, yeah, just go ahead and show your, your, the parallels and, and what would you say is like, you know, most striking about that? Yeah. Well, I mean, we can, um, we can look at some of the, some of the stuff like my, I mean, for me, the, the thing that really hit me, uh, was was the parallel of the of the ox and the the goring ox, which is the which is the last one there. On if you just jump to that, um, we can start with that because this was this is something that you know a lot of a lot of students read when they're um, when they're studying. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. Well, I don't know. You you could tell me. Is this something mm -hmm. that you've you've encountered in studies? Um, I, I encountered it through uh, my Semitic studies when I started reading Akkadian and we started reading. Hammurabi's law, um, mm -hmm. but I don't know how much it's used in the in the classroom for theology these days. <laughs> no, I haven't gotten to that part yet. No, but <laughs> uh, so so what what we have here is basically um, so I've I've gra I've grabbed the parallel from the laws of Eshnuna instead of Hammur okay. uh, or um, so the, the parallels with Eshnuna and Hammurabi, and mm. um, and then I'll I'll. Get, get, explain it in a second what happens why this is interesting but so yeah. in the laws of Ishnuna, which is a little earlier than Hammurabi we have this case of an ox who gores another ox and and kills it and then they they like they're supposed to split the cost the the owner and the the owner of the two oxes right so they mm -hmm. there there's this idea of fairness between um things that if you have a, an ox that's around killing something that uh, there's somebody who's liable for for this and that's the owner of the of the ox and um and then in Hammurabi's law we also have this this law that if an ox gores a man to death while it's passing through the streets there's no claim like there's no liability 
And and this is also something that's really interesting. Like, is if there's a random a random thing that happens on the base, like just on the basis of an animal doing something that it shouldn't, mm-hmm. um, there's there's no liability, so nobody's punished. But what both of these law codes agree on is that if an ox is a habitual gore, if it usually goes around killing people or, or has done it before, mm-hmm. and and the uh, the owner knows it, but doesn't protect people from the the ox Mm -hmm. uh, and the ox then kills someone then the owner of the ox is liable and what we what we have here is that the in the eshnuna laws the owner of the ox has to give 20 shekels of silver and and in hammurabi it's uh, it's 30 shekels of silver which which are given and then if it's a slave then um it's supposed to be 15 shekels in the Shnuna and, and 20 shekels in the, mm-hmm. in the laws of Hammurabi. And so what we, what we kind of end up with when we, when we look at this is that we have a, um, you know, a pretty clear understanding that if you have a, if you have a, an ox that's doing bad things, you're supposed to treat it in, in, in a certain way, Right. You follow me so far? Yes, sir. Yeah. So uh, let me read then, um, while you have that on the screen very clear, let me read from Exodus um, chapter 21. And Mm -hmm. um, it, it goes like this. When an ox gores a man or a woman to death, the ox shall be stoned and its flesh shall not be eaten, but the owner of the ox shall be liable. And if the ox has been accustomed to goring in the past and its owner has been warned, but has not restrained it, and it kills a man or a woman, the ox shall be stoned and the owner shall be put to death. But if a ransom is imposed on the owner, then the owner shall pay whatever is imposed for the redemption of the victim's life. But if it gores a boy or a girl, the owner shall be dealt with according to the same rule. And if the the ox gores a male or female slave, the owner shall pay the slave owner 30 shekels of silver and the ox shall be stoned. Hmm. So, I mean, uh, yeah, this is, this is one of those things where, where you, so you can look at the, you look at these texts and and you listen to what we find in the biblical text. It's, it's impossible to not see the parallels. Because we have we have the same logic in these in these laws, right? It starts with saying, "Well, a, a random act of of animal violence is it sucks, but the owner isn't going to be liable." Like the in, in the biblical one, they're actually stricter and say we have to kill the ox, stone the ox that that did it. Mm. Um, when we go to the next level where it kills a person. They, they agree that the if an owner knows about the the habitual goring of their ox, mm. they have to be punished. And and what's really interesting is that here the biblical law code is also stricter. Like it's saying you you kill it, right? You mm. you you're liable to death, um, but you can also be redeemed, which means you can buy your way out of it. And so basically, it's saying. That if you're rich enough, you know, if you're wealthy, if you're wealthy and you own a bunch of oxen, it does this and you can buy your way out of the problem. Um, and then again, we have then the movement to the slave. So what if it's a slave and is a slave worth the same as a, as a regular person? No, mm. it's not. Um, it's, it's worth mm. 20 shekels of, of silver. And so we have that. I mean, we have the same logic. We have the same categories. We have the same problem that's involved. And so uh, for me, that shows us that we're we're dealing with more than just like a, a, a random thing that where people would say, Hey, everybody knows about all the ox goring people. And of course, then you have to regulate it and you have to do all this, but now it's like, it's, it's directly, mm. it's directly relatable, both in the, the different problems that it outlines and in the way that the punishments grow and relate to each other. So, um, I think that for me was like the really the first real striking example that I mm-hmm. that I was was exposed to, and that made me want to know more about it um, in general. Yeah. So just for some clarity here, uh, 
so verse 32 if the bull gores a male or female slave the owner must pay 30 shekels of silver yep so that's what they have to pay if the slave dies yes uh, but um, is there another mention where if just a normal person dies from the from the bull yeah, so that so if a normal if a normal person then it's in verse thirty it says if a ransom is imposed on the owner, and so the the ransom is it's it's the redemption of the life is what we're what we're talking about there, mm-hmm. and and that is the that is like the the biblical terminology for paying uh, instead of being um, being executed. Mm, right okay. and so this that is, it's that, that okay. um so this is this it's the same well, it's the same terminology that's used in redeeming like the firstborn right so mm. so i mean you have it with the whole jesus uh, going to the temple and and simeon and all that where where it's like he was going to be redeemed uh at the temple and and what you what you would do is is instead because god has kind of already said that the firstborn belongs to him right and that's uh that's that's there but you would redeem that person uh mm. from from that situation i guess mm. but this is also it's like a legal terminology of buying someone um uh, yeah, buying someone's uh freedom or whatever mm. yeah so it says the owner may redeem his life by the payment of whatever is demanded so the the normal non-slave he pays whatever is demanded which could be a lot i would assume but if it's just a slave, it's thirty shekels. Right. Okay. Yeah. Already. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's that's pretty obvious. Um, so j- I just can't help but ask. So, like, in Eshnuna, and you know, you have this idea of causing its death. Two o- two ox owners shall divide the value of the living ox and the carcass of the dead ox. Mm. So that's not in the in Hammurabi, or unless I'm missing something, it's not in the Exodus narrative. So. Well, so it, it is. Like... So it is actually. If we go okay. to if we go okay. to verse thirty five, um, mm-hmm. Exodus thirty five. Uh, sorry, Exodus twenty one thirty five. Um, there you go. Then we yep. have it. So if someone's ox hurts the ox of another so that it dies, they shall sell the live ox and divide the price of it, and the dead animal they shall also divide. But mm-hmm. if it was known that the ox was accustomed to going in the past and the owner has not restrained it, the owner shall restore mm-hmm. the restore ox for ox, but keep the dead animal. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yep. So, so it is there, um, and it's just in that case, it's it's uh, slightly out of order compared to Eshnuna. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, that's really interesting because, of course, it's not like you've got similar ideas in in both Hammurabi and Eshnuna that correct me if I'm wrong that aren't in both. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's really interesting. Mm. Um, so it's not like the the biblical text. If we even even if we just assume like hey wherever these laws came from it was had nothing to do with like just straight come from heaven it's not from just copying one from one right right so yeah so that that's really interesting yeah and I mean so well I mean we we should also be be aware that there could be other intermediary right. texts. Mm-hmm. There could be other other versions, other forms of the laws of Hammurabi that did include this law in that place. Um, right. So it's uh, like we, we can't make a negative assumption about mm-hmm. how it was copied based on the differences. But what we can say is that the um, in the forms that we know, the biblical mm-hmm. text has definitely reordered and 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 made a more uh, uh, made their own version of it, and and that's how mm. that's how I read it. I mean, I, okay. I, so I, I don't, I don't think anyone argues that we're that what we have in the biblical law codes is a complete just Hebrew translation of some Akkadian or or Hittite law code or anything mm-hmm. like that. Um, so what what and, and that's kind of my. <laughs> what interests me the most is this idea that mm-hmm. it's it's taken out of one context and brought into another, and mm-hmm. and that's what we have here is definitely a contextualization of the law code. It's it's given it's given its Hebrew form, and like the prices for things change, and the idea of the redemption is added in, and the important things are there for the Hebrew law code. So it's it's done purposefully. In the way we have it there, like regardless of of how it's you know what its antecedents are, uh, and 
but I, I'm just, I'm also worried, I'm, or I get nervous by constructing too many texts around uh, an, uh, an author or a scribe or whatever. Like if we say, well, he had to have been, had both Eshnuna and Hammurabi and the Hittite laws and the, then it's just such a mess. Like we're imagining some great library somewhere where people could sit that, <laughs> that would have access to all these things. We, we don't know that either. Um, mm. But what we do know is that the laws of Hammurabi were definitely in circulation in the ancient Near East, in the places where the Israelites were, at the time when this law code was probably written. And so I think that is like, that's one of the big things that has been argued that I think is um, at least making headway in, in, in scholarship is this idea that, okay, we, we, we don't have to think that what is in the Bible is the laws of Hammurabi, but it does seem like there is such a close correspondence that, that there is, there is some kind of relationship there. And, and so this, um, let's see, I have a book. I have the book somewhere. I don't know. It's this book. Um, where, oh, I, I see it. I put my computer on it because it was making so much noise. Um, so this book, um, Inventing uh, Inventing God's Law by David Wright, is uh, is definitely the go-to resource yeah. for that. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a really good book. It's something that's inspired me a lot. Um, and, and I think... Um, yeah, we have actually a, a picture of one of his diagrams there. Do you want to bring that up? That picture with the casuistic yeah, laws where um, where he shows, um, there we go. So he, he shows basically the, the, the correspondences of, um, of a number of the call of the laws in what we call the covenant code. So that's Exodus 21 uh, to 23, which is a specialized part of the law codes of the Bible. Um, mm. And this is, so, uh, yeah, I don't know how, <laughs> how far back should we go. So let's uh, just at least define the, the term casuistic, right? Because the casuistic laws in the covenant code, so in, the, in, this, in this short section of Exodus, are different from the majority of the laws of the rest of the, of the Torah, because mm. they, instead of saying, do this, don't do that, like prohibitions or or um, things like that. They are written in in the terms of of a case, and would say, when this happens, this is mm -hmm. the punishment. So it's an if then, when mm -hmm. then uh, situation that is very repetitive, but is is completely parallel to like the laws of Hammurabi, which also use this mm -hmm. casuistic case law style. And mm. in this section, that is where we find these parallels that are that are for many of them in an identical order as well. And so we see that like we have we have the the laws about slaves and debt slavery. Then we have uh, child rebellion. We have the men fighting an injury. We have killing uh, someone of the lower class. We have uh, causing a miscarriage. We have the goring ox. We have animal theft. We have depositing yeah. of animals, and and so on, and and these things come in exactly the same order. And then there's a couple places where the order is is changed, and and anyone who wants to read the you know the several hundred pages of David Wright's book, he also explains why these things happen and sees a system in in the restructuring that happens here. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, that's really interesting. Okay, all right. And was there any other? interesting parallels there that you wanted to mention yeah so i i think one thing that is that i i, I think is a really fun one is a more it's maybe a little more theoretical but it's the idea of of the um uh, 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 an eye for an eye tooth for tooth life for life mm -hmm. thing that is kind of like i guess is is how we think of old testament law in general isn't would you say that i mean i've i've been out of the us for so long that uh that i might think how europeans think americans think about the <laughs> about old testament law um mm. but it's uh like we think of that kind of eye for an eye tooth for a tooth as being the kind of definition of old testament legal thinking <laughs> yeah 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 well no it's funny for me because i i don't even uh spend that much time in just mainstream evangelical circles mm -hmm. or whatever <laughs> so like what they think doesn't even mean that i think it <laughs> well yeah i mean and i don't oh, but yeah no yeah. that's a, that's the stereotype but, for sure but I, yeah because i think there's like this uh yeah there's kind of an idea that the 
that the the Old Testament is kind of defined by this retribution law, um, and and so oh, I can actually change the slides. So um, I'll, oh, there you go. Um, so uh, yeah, that was the that one. Oh yeah, I forgot. Actually, let's look at this one first because I think that's also a, a fun one. Um, <laughs> I forgot about that. That the the we have these laws about the the rebellious child is is also really interesting. Um, just the fact that there's this kind of um, there's a relationship here. Right? We see that if a child strikes his father, um, they should cut off his hand. And we see whoever strikes his father or mother shall be put to death, it says in Exodus. And and so we see two things actually in this that we also saw in the ox goring example, where um, one, the Exodus thing adds the females. So that's an interesting thing. And that's one of those things that mm. sometimes people argue and say, hey, look how progressive the biblical laws are. They they mm. regulate the women as well. Um, but on the other hand, um, it's actually much more severe to be killed for hitting your father or mother than, than to have your hand cut off. I mean, it's it, either way, it's not very appealing in our standards, mm. but it's it's more radical to to actually require them to be killed. And so in that way, the Exodus law is is actually more severe and and then not better for the people. <laughs> so it's uh, there, there's this kind of mixed signal going on there. Mm, um, interesting. And then we also see then in the next one there on number 14, that if a man should kidnap a young child of another man, he shall be killed. Um, and and then we see the same thing in Exodus uh, twenty one sixteen. That whoever kidnaps a person, whether that person has been sold or is still held in possession, shall be put to death. So it's like it's kind of it takes it a step further. It's saying, yeah, you kidnap anybody, you you should be you should be put to death for it. But also, if you kidnap a slave and sell them, or kidnap someone and sell them off as a slave, then you still should be put to death, even if they don't find that person. And hmm. and then um, we have the 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 final one that if a child. Um, uh, so it's, a, it's these are technical terms, but if a child belonging to the upper class or a certain class um, says you are not my father, or you're not my mother, they should cut off his tongue. And and I think that basically <laughs> is paralleled in the whoever curses father, their father or mother should be put to death. Um, so that's uh, you know that again, like cutting off the tongue, or cutting out the tongue, or putting them to death. Like they're both severe, but I guess death is yeah. is, is always worse. Yeah. But so the um, then eye for an eye. So we have this series of laws from 196 to 200 in Hammurabi uh, that that you know that read like this. So if an awilu, so an, an awilu is the uh, Akkadian term, the Babylonian term for a a free man, a free landowner man mm. kind of person. Um, so if a if a if a free person uh, would blind the eye of another free person, another awilu, they shall blind his eye. So an eye for an eye. Um, if he should break the bone of his of another awilu, they should break his bone. Um, if he should blind the eye of a commoner or break the bone of a commoner, he should weigh out and deliver 60 shekels of silver. Okay, that's interesting. Um, if he should blind the eye of an awilu slave or break the bone of an awilu slave, he would weigh out the, and deliver one half of his value in silver. And then um, it says, yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, so if an awilu should knock out the tooth of another, then uh, they should knock out his tooth. And so Exodus 21, 23 to 24 sums this up pretty good. If any harm follows, then you shall give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. And you might ask, well, where's the life for life? Well, um, I think we have a, a parallel um, pretty much here from, from the one that's actually in Hammurabi's 207 to Exodus 21, 12. If he should die from his beating, he shall also swear I did not strike him intentionally. If he the victim is a member of the Uilo class, he shall weigh out 30 shekels of silver. Um, and so Exodus 21, 12 says, whoever die, strikes a person mortally shall be put to death. But if it was not premeditated, but came about by an act of God, then I will appoint for you a place to which the killer may flee. But if someone willfully attacks and kills another by treachery, you shall take it, the killer from my altar for execution. So we have this idea that... Um, Tooth for tooth, a life, you know, a tooth for tooth, an eye for an eye, hand for hand, like these kind of equal, um, you know, equal retribution for a crime. Mm -hmm. And that there's a difference between intentionality and unintentionality uh, that, that kind of goes throughout. And I think those are, um, those are really important principles 
that are interesting and that um, I think have played a major role in law giving up until our time. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, this is one of those things that um, might quickly become, you know, political. So I, I'm not going to spend any time on it, but, <laughs> but I think it's, it's interesting to note that this is, uh, this is a really ancient understanding of, of, uh, punishment and retribution mm. that is regulated here. Mm. Yeah. That, that tooth for tooth and eye for eyes is oddly specific. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, I'd be, I'd be really interested to see why why the need for the the tooth for tooth would be mentioned are they uh are, are people really knocking people's teeth off like that yeah well i mean you know what what i guess like we, we have to imagine that people fought uh throughout history that i mean there were bar fights and there were there were disagreements <laughs> and there were you know thefts and and beatings and yeah. and all that kind of stuff and <laughs> Yep. And how do you, and the question is, how do you deal with it? Like, what's the, like, I think like for, for me, what I see is instead of seeing what you, you allowed, like what you're, what you have to do to someone is one thing, mm. but what you're allowed to do is something else. Uh. And so instead of saying like, oh, well you, if you got your tooth knocked out, you have to go pull that guy's tooth. Like that, that is weird. But to say you got your tooth knocked out, you're not allowed to kill him. You're only allowed to pull out his tooth. You got, oh, mm. he blinded you. Well, you're only allowed to blind him. You're not allowed to kill him. And then it becomes oh, kind of a, yeah, it becomes more of a justice principle to protect people uh, also from not being punished. Yeah, yeah I don't know. What, what's it say in the, it's a, what's it say in our constitution? Um, uh, uh, I, I can't remember American anymore. Sorry. It's the uh, un, cruel and unusual punishment, right? Oh, yes. So it's kind of that, this is kind of regulating that. Mm. Yeah, that's really interesting. Mm -hmm. All right. So, uh, but as you said before, we don't, we get like what one or two examples in the entire ancient Near East, and that includes the biblical text where these laws are actually used in any type of way, like, hey, because of this law says this, then we have to follow this. So, right? well, I mean, so if it, so it, within the biblical text, there are examples of, of laws being used so that, okay. that we do find self-referencing within the, the later texts of the, of the Hebrew Bible, we do find reference to, as it says in the law of Moses and things like that. Um, mm -hmm. But, but when we're looking at the cuneiform stuff, like there's, there, it's virtually absent that they refer to the other law codes but we mm -hmm. do see laws being upheld. So, um, mm -hmm. so there's, th that's a clear difference. And, and so what, but what we lack is, uh, any evidence that like, so, so let's say laws of purity or laws against, uh, there being other temples to Yahweh or things like that, that we find in the biblical law code, like we, we, we have other temples <laughs> to Yahweh that are that are that are evidenced right right in history. Um, we have, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, evidence of all these other uh, worship sites, um, altars to Baal and Asherah. We have we have these kind of things happening throughout Israelite history, throughout Judean history, that that seem to indicate that people weren't just, you know, following the laws of the Torah, and mm -hmm. and then. Part, partially what's behind the narratives of the books of you know, Samuel and Kings are, are telling exactly that story, that the kings weren't enforcing it, the, the priests weren't enforcing it, there wasn't any you know, enforcement of laws. Uh, and so we I, get, have to get all the way up to the time of Josiah in the narrative where then suddenly it says, hey, <laughs> by the way, there's this law code that we should have been following all the time. And then there's this big ruckus, right? Um, and And so it's, um, I think like probably there were periods where, where people were aware, not aware of, of things, but, but how big the reach of it was and, and mm -hmm. stuff is very, very difficult to define. And mm -hmm. uh, I guess like you've probably heard of Unitan Adler and his, his recent book on, sure. on, uh, the, yeah, the archeology span of, of, uh, the use of the Torah or the influence of the Torah in the, in the, you know, in the second temple period. And, and he says, basically, you know, once we get before the Hasmonean period, we 
we just we just don't have that evidence that we would think we would if hmm. there was widespread practice of these laws. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. So obviously that's that whole thing of like the the writers of the biblical text or outside the Bible, that was a big argument used by someone like John Walton um, to say, hey, maybe the Torah wasn't supposed to be like this, you know, this law code that you have to follow, specifically these rules. Like some, some have said, hey, like, you know, eye for eye, that's the maximum, that's like a guideline, but you can use it, you know, whatever you find necessary or whatever best um like a general way to live kind of thing um but if you're saying that hey the biblical text does have these references well um then you know that seems to me that like hey they they did see that as more something you should follow well um, someone did um and okay. and so i think we probably have to differentiate between the the scribes um, and the elite class that that you know, may have been connected to the to the temple worship or, or things like that, uh, and and then the everyday life of everyday people. So I think there's probably, um, I think I think it's very likely that there was someone who knew these laws um, for for a very long period of time, uh, and and I so I. I, I'm not. I'm not a complete uh, minimalist that thinks all of this was written in the in the Hellenistic period after 323 or something like that. Like I think there's probably traditions that are quite old here, uh, and and so it makes sense that they're they're being passed on and there's somebody retelling them, copying them, whatever. Uh, but what uh, that that's different than them applying to everyone in order to have an identity as a Judean or as a as a Jew or as an Israelite or what, whatever you want to define define the group as at different periods of time and so i think we um we probably often go into the to the um the trap of of trying to view um, the law as monolithic uh and in history because it has a form it has now and it had and we know that it had the significance that it had at a certain time and so like the fact that the law became the Torah became that kind of standard for how how people should both act in the things that are described in the Torah, but also then mm -hmm. apply to other situations that aren't described in the Torah. That that is a that is something that's a it's it's a it's a later uh, feature of the Torah rather than the original way in which it was understood. And so, um, mm -hmm. but but also like we. I don't know if we have much evidence for for Walton's position either to say that um, that it was used in a way to say here's the limits of what you could do to someone. Like we, like we, the, those very few cases are um, are not actually the the main gist of the law. Like we we move away from the covenant code from the from the these chapters of Exodus pretty quickly and get into ritual law, and mm -hmm. and it becomes about how to celebrate the 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 holidays right how to celebrate the festivals how to make the offerings in the temple and and i do believe that there are um it, there's much i think a lot of these things were much more strictly considered um at different times than than like the laws of well wait how do we punish this person like I, i'm not sure that the um that people thought of the like the you should you know slaughter a lamb or whatever and and then said well I, you know, i'm not going to do it this time uh, or i'm just going to slaughter a quarter of a lamb or i don't know like i, I feel like it's kind of people were either in or out at that point but i mm -hmm. again we're like it's it, we just have so little evidence of what people are actually doing that we can only look to the text and see that the text change what's required for the different um offerings for different sacrifices over time so we have like starting with pretty pretty easy sacrifices to make to getting very advanced towards the later texts and that that implies a more system systematic and and controlled context for the for the rituals that are taking place and then mm. probably more people involved in it mm. yeah yeah so we have so if i could summarize a big part of what you said so 
you've mentioned how it's possible that a lot of people didn't know about the the law codes, which is quite obvious. And, you know, whether they're ignoring it or just didn't know about in general, that would certainly explain why we don't have many mentions of it. But it's also possible that there was a, you know, a small or even big group of people that didn't, that they, they had it, but it's, we don't necessarily know how they even used it when they did have it. Um, but then you're also saying that when you compare it with the other, like the festivals and sacrifices and stuff like that, that they were seen as much more, I guess, maybe literal or followed more closely, like for sure. So it seems like, hey, if those are um, used that way as like, hey, you got to follow that, then it would make sense that the law codes were also followed that way. You... Yeah, or at least for, for the people who subscribe to it, right? And that's where we yeah. don't know the reach of the of this of the law codes. So, like, I mean, it, it, it's it's possible that we have a very, 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 very small group of people that say these sacrifices are what we hold to, and we will bring the the daily and the weekly and the monthly and the yearly sacrifices, and mm -hmm. there will be a priestly class that will live off of the sacrifices we bring, and and that's perfectly reasonable. Um, and we know that when we get to the Hasmonean period, that there is this class of priests that do live in this way. And so mm -hmm. something was happening, but what we, what we really don't know is how wide that reach was and, and how, how many people, you know, we, we have these descriptions in the new Testament of, you know, people mm -hmm. making their, their journey to Jerusalem for the festival. Right. And, um, and the probably exaggerations about the numbers and the, and the, and the fact whether everyone did it or whatever, but like mm -hmm. there, there were obviously people making those journeys and doing that because it was the festival. And so we have to be like, we have to find some way to, to balance these things that we don't have a widespread archeological or textual record that says mm -hmm. that, that this was practiced extensively, but we also seem to have a development that ends up with that. These things are practiced widely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. All right. So I don't know how much time you have. Um, so feel free to let me know if you got to go. But uh, there's two main questions I wanted to ask. Is, yep. One, was there any other like priestly duties or, you know, sacrificial, sacrificial things that really parallel other texts or other practices outside of the, the biblical text? Kind of like we have similarities with the law. Is it does it apply the same way with the, the sacrifices and the, the festivals and all that? Yeah. So, I mean, so that's, that is something I haven't done a lot of work on, so I don't want to graze too far out of my own mm -hmm. pasture. Um, but it's, um, there, there are definitely parallels between the priesthood, between the temple structures, between these sort of things in, in Babylonian and, and Assyrian contexts, but mm -hmm. they're not regulated in these law codes that, that we're looking at. And so there's like, mm -hmm. that's where, um, that's where like we see the difference, especially in like the chart that we showed from David Wright's book. And then what he's doing mm -hmm. is saying like in this very small section of Exodus in these couple of chapters in Exodus, there are tons of parallels to the cuneiform law codes. And, and that is really interesting because they're just in this tiny little space and they look different in the law, in the Bible, and they parallel the cuneiform Babylonian laws. Hmm. But then when we move on to this ritual stuff, um, the, the parallels aren't collected in these law codes in the same way. Um, and so mm -hmm. then what we can look at is other ways in which sacrifices are done and other, other uh, prohibitions and, and things like that. And we do see, definitely see parallels, you know, throughout the ancient world for these things, but the, the systemization of it is something I'm not, I'm not sure of, um, I'm not aware of that, that we have in the same degree. Mm-hmm. I see that. Yeah, that's really fascinating. Mm. Yeah. And so the, the a lot of people are probably wondering like, hey, so Deuteronomy 18, 1 to 3 says, The Lord said to Moses, me, speak to the Israelites and say to them, I am the Lord your God. You must not do as they do in Egypt, where you used to live, and you must not do as they do in the land of Canaan, where I am bringing to you. Do not follow their practices. So a lot of people will be like, hey, you know, that's what God said. But then it's like, super super odd that we have these other texts like you know what i guess it's technically before in the biblical narrative which are clearly god or it's the, the text seems to be saying hey you should follow these and they just happen to be like the other nation so 
how do scholars address that or what do they think about all that? Yeah, well, I think, I mean, I, I, yeah, so I, I'm glad you bring up that verse because it's, all, it's a really fun one, um, which to me um, is, is part of the, the work of contextualization and authorization of, of the Mosaic law rather than some other thing. So like this is this is saying that hey you might even hear the laws of other people <laughs> you might hear about the way they do things but but you're supposed to do it my way and this is again giving authority to Moses as the lawgiver and this collection as the as the actual one right so it's kind of like part of the epilogue here that it's saying by the way there are other people in the world but don't don't mess with them don't don't get involved um, and it's it's I think it's part of an internal logic of the law code itself, and and this is something that we find in the other law codes too. That hey, um, by the way, you know about these other people, uh, but they're they're not us, and so don't don't live like them, don't be like them. But then mm. when we read the law codes of all these people, they're all so similar. Uh, and so from my perspective as a as a you know, historian and. Uh, and so who's, who's interested in in these connections? I would say this is just like this is just a pretty typical polemic against other people, and and is trying to say what we have is the right thing and what they have is the wrong thing. And even though it turns out to be the same thing, uh, it it doesn't matter. It's about the the yeah, I, I mean propaganda or rhetoric or whatever. It's like saying us we we we've got the truth and we've got the best thing, and, and just make sure that we stand against them. And that's that's pretty normal, um, but I think for people that are more, um, I don't know, tight knit, uh, looking to protect the biblical record as the as the one true thing, then um, they would they they probably tend to talk about the practices or the laws of other people as being really really bad, and the the biblical revelation as being really really good, and and would mm -hmm. kind of look for those things that might elevate the status of the biblical law as compared to the other ones. Um, but mm -hmm. like like I've mentioned a couple of times, like in my reading of it, there's like there's no systematic, um, there's no systematic elevation of the law in the biblical record compared to the other versions. Like there's there's some things that seem to be fairer or uh, more in line with modern values or whatever um and there's some things that go the other way and and so we like it's it's hard to make this kind of statement from a whatever moral or or ethical standpoint that that the biblical law just got it right and every everybody else just had it wrong it's just that it's it's kind of this deuteronomy 18 is basically saying like hey um ours is what's right we are yeah. what's right mm -hmm. And, and that kind of really continues with it in the line of the Deuteronomistic theology, which is saying, don't, don't worship God. Don't look at other gods. Don't, don't participate in anything that has to do with any God outside of the temple in Jerusalem, which is the only place you're really allowed to be and worship and do. And so anything that has to do with Egyptians or Canaanites or whatever is, is going to be harmful. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's really interesting. So from what I've grown up on, what, what I would, typically think of when I read that just without any specific context of any of this, I'm going to be thinking, Hey, so when I see do not follow their practices, I'm thinking of each individual thing that they do. Don't do any of that, which of course doesn't make any sense with why the biblical text is the way it is, but maybe it's a way of saying like as a whole, their, their way of doing things, their practices, don't follow their practices, follow our practices. Right. Is that a good way to say it? Well, and, and I think what it comes down to is worship. Like what, what what's really being communicated here is is don't in like you you've been in Egypt where they worship these Egyptian gods and they do their Egyptian sacrifices, don't do those. And when you get to Canaan, you're gonna meet all these other gods and all these other people that worship all these other gods and don't do that either. Um, you're supposed to just worship God alone. Mm -hmm. And and again, if we're reading this in the, kind of the traditional um, academic way and saying that this is something that isn't written in the time of Moses or spoken in the time of Moses, but is rather like in the time of Hezekiah or mm -hmm. Josiah or, yeah. you know, one of these later Kings that are trying to centralize the worship of, of Yahweh and get rid of the practices that are going on among the people. Then this is like this kind of rhetoric saying, um, God told y'all <laughs> not to do this not to follow the ways of the Canaanites. We are 
we are Judeans, we are Israelites, we only worship Yahweh in the temple, in the Jerusalem temple, which it says in Deuteronomy, the place God will choose for his name. And, and that's, then you can point to it, right? This is, you can say, well, hey, it says it there, so you guys need to follow those laws. Mm. And, and so I think it's, it's probably more related to that than just like the mundane, like, if the Canaanites take a tooth for a tooth, then you shouldn't take a tooth for a tooth. It's, mm. uh, I think it's, it's, you know, but, but I, I do see where that can be read into it as well. Like it's that kind of don't do anything they do. Uh, it will be really hard. <laughs> it would be really hard to make that happen. Mm. Yeah, no, that's so fascinating. All right. Um, uh, please forgive me one more question. Here. Yep. No problem. All right. Um, so we, you know, you briefly talked about, maybe there's nothing else to add, but, um, you know, I'm trying to figure out in my head, like how scholars of considered like hey how this biblical text might have came about specifically in these laws like i guess you have some options well the first option is obviously like hey it's straight from god like and you know it just happens to to be extremely similar to a lot of these other codes uh, but at the same time it's straight from god um maybe even god like hey knew that the, the israelites were uh, gonna be thinking the similar way so they're like hey um, you know, I'm going to give you something very similar, change things here and there, uh, or on the other hand, like tradition, like you've got multiple traditions and someone comes along and says, Hey, like, yeah, this is the best, we'll work like a bio and that's the best way to do it or the best combination. Um, anything to add there as far as like, I don't know, ways people have perceived like the law code coming together. Yeah. Well, I mean, uh, so as a as a scholar of language and literature like it's what's interesting for me is is seeing the way things are similar the way parallels you know show up across mm -hmm. time and and geography and and the way um I, ideas and texts do in, in fact influence each other uh, in, over quite large distances and and i think that now that we I mean, we, we have more and more knowledge about the ancient world, about the connections between societies um, that it's it's hard for me to go down the, the route of saying, hey, this is just like just this is all isolated, that that Israel just happened to have this revelation that was so similar to other people's thinking without having any contact or any influence by that, whereas everyone else was influencing each other. And, and that's where like it becomes, yeah. it becomes really difficult for me is if we're going to say that one people aren't participating in the world around them, but everyone else is doing it. And, and so by just by thinking about the way literature works, um, it's like we might not have all the sources. We don't have all the, all the links of the chains between things, mm -hmm. but, but we can be pretty sure that, that people are, are sharing knowledge, are sharing uh, influences. Uh, over over you know, great spans of of, of distance and, and also over time, and and so it's I think it's theoretically much more interesting to talk about how these things evolve and and end up being you know, how how Israel ends up participating in these things mm -hmm. and how they receive the traditions of Babylonia of Egypt of Canaan of of the Hittites, whatever, into their own literature and form them and make them into their own, rather than trying to say how there might be the slimmest chance that they actually got it and just happened to get the same thing as other people had. So like, for me, it's just, uh, it's, it's very clear that history um, makes sense as a model <laughs> for the development of the law codes. And, and it's clear for me that um, Israelites were in contact with with Babylonian cuneiform mall at some point, mm. and and were able to integrate that into their own thinking about the law. They were in contact with other societies and the way they worshipped their gods, and they integrated that into their law. They just like they do with with the stories of Genesis. I mean, like I guess you're gonna you you're gonna deal with that with uh, with Kip and and Josh, but uh, mm. but you know that we could say the same exact thing about the flood story. Um, and about other things that we have these, we have obvious connections within all of the other ancient Near Eastern material. And, and if we're going to pretend like the biblical connections are random, but all the other connections are, are historical and literary um, realities, 
then I don't, I don't know what we're doing. Like <laughs> it's, yeah, I think it's much more reasonable to, to include Israel as part of the ancient world and, and that what they're doing is participating in, in the world in which they existed. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So you don't have any specific ideas of like how that might have come about, like, in, I don't know, interesting ideas other than like, you know, I mean, I guess, I guess like another example maybe is like, Hey, you have some scribes, like, uh, he's got his mostly Israelite law. And then he comes across the law of Hammurabi and like, Hmm, that's a good one. I'll put that one in there. And that one, that's also a good one. You know, that's wise. Um, any, any ideas like that? Well, so I, so yeah, def I mean, I, I definitely think that there is, there's a very strong possibility that the laws of Hammurabi were circulated in such a way that Israelite scribes would have been exposed to them. And, and the question is only when, um, and, mm -hmm. and because we don't have a good enough idea of exactly the chronology of the development of the Torah, I think it mm -hmm. then makes it so it doesn't really matter where we place that connection. Um, but what we do know is that in the so the neo babylonian period the time in which the the israelites were or the judeans were in exile in babylon the laws of hammurabi were still being copied and were in circulation we have tablets from that time from ancient babylon and from other cities in mesopotamia we have tablets even from from syria from canaan that that have the laws uh, re fragments of the laws of Hammurabi. So oh, wow. it's there's there's no question that if we even if we follow the biblical narrative, biblical timeline, there would have been contact with Babylonians. Mm -hmm. And so then the question is just how early these laws are, and whether there was contact made in the old Babylonian period, or if there was some some other connections. But but the laws of Hammurabi are spread throughout the ancient Near East. And, and so contact is not a problem. And so then the, the real problem is that we just don't know enough about what Israelite scribes were doing. And so we could speculate and say like, hey, at some point this, this made it in there. Um, but, you know, it's, 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 part of the, it's part of the narrative now. But when it, was, when it was sewn in there is really hard to say. Yeah. Well, the biblical deck, does it ever say like, hey, we got these laws right here from from straight from god on on the mountain like it says obviously there's the ten commandments but it doesn't mention the other laws well like it, where exactly they came from well right. yeah moses goes back up and so that's like that's one of those things that you can you can play with if you're if you're interested is to go through um say you know exodus 20 to, to through the end of the book and and just look at the number of times Moses is mentioned as going up and down and he goes up and down a bunch. Mm -hmm. Um, and, yeah. and so there's, there's definitely several narratives that are sewn together and episodes that are, that are put together there, but, but it does appear that there is, uh, an intentional, um, you know, moving of, of Moses up the mountain to get the laws. And so mm -hmm. like they are depicted as though that's what he heard up on the mountains. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. Interesting. Okay. All right. Well, that's all I got for you. This has been really fun. I appreciate you coming on here. Yep. Everybody make sure to check out your channel. Uh, it is called The Bible Was Written Backwards. That's right. And you have a lot of other interviews. Anything else that you want people to know about, like a book or something you're writing? Yeah. So I've, I've got a, I do have a book I'm working on. I don't know if anybody out there is going to think it's fun. Maybe your audience likes, uh, <laughs> likes riddles, but I'm, I'm in the process of editing and translating a bunch of Syriac biblical riddles um that yeah. i'm going to be publishing i don't know in the next year or so hopefully um so i i can i can test your your knowledge i'll give you one of them here as a teaser okay. um so who was uh who was not born but died and who was born but never died and who was born and died but didn't stink well the, the the two people in the biblical text were Enoch and Elijah, right? Yep. So that's the people who were born but didn't die. But mm. who so who was not born but died? Who was not born but died? Oh, I have no idea. Adam. <laughs> oh, interesting, yeah. And then who was born and died but didn't stink? Born and died but didn't stink. Oh, I have no idea about this one. That's Lot's <laughs> wife because she turned into salt. 
And this is a, a very ancient text. That this someone... is, yeah, so this is, comes from a Syriac manuscript. Uh, Syriac is a dialect of Aramaic. It was like uh, spoken by Eastern Christians, still spoken by Eastern Christians, the Eastern Syriac Church. Um, and this is from probably around 800, um, 800 uh, CE. So it's, uh, mm. it's uh, yeah, and I've, I have collecting manuscripts of these biblical riddles and uh, yeah, <laughs> putting it together. So it's... Uh, that's what I'm spending <laughs> my time on for the for the time being. Oh, that's amazing. All right. <laughs> All right. Yeah, we'll definitely have to check out that one. All right. Well, it's been fun having you on here. And I, I everyone should go check out your channel. A lot of interesting stuff and uh, helpful for understanding the biblical text as well as just what they were thinking and all that. But otherwise, I do hope you have a good rest of your day, Dr. Munger. And I appreciate you coming on here. Yep. Thanks a lot. Yeah, awesome.